Hello, and welcome to On the Marie Curie Couch, the podcast that aims to break down taboos and start open, honest conversations about death and dying. I'm Jason Davidson. I'm a social worker by profession, and I've worked in palliative care, hospice care, and bereavement support services for more than a decade. Each episode, we'll be speaking to a well-known guest to find out about how they feel about their own mortality and how their personal experience of bereavement has shaped the way they live their life. Today, I'm on the Marie Curie couch with Derek Evans, MB, also known as Mr. Motivator. Born in Jamaica in 1952, Derek moved to the UK as a young child. And in the 80s, he began teaching exercise classes in Northwest London. Derek then rose to fame in 1993 with regular appearances on ITV's GMTV where, dressed in his trademark colourful lycra outfits, he encouraged the nation to exercise. In 2000, he left GMTV and as well as releasing numerous exercise videos, has become a motivational speaker and a regular performer at music festivals and wellbeing roadshows. Derek was made an MBE in 2020 for services to health and fitness. Derek Evans, welcome to the Marie Curie Couch. Thank you. So nice to be in the house. Derek, can I start today by asking if you could tell us about a significant bereavement that you've experienced in your life? There have been a number, you know, and in fact, it's so interesting because only yesterday, a good friend of mine who we uh, kind of grew up together in Leicester and we went boys brigade, we lived in the church together and stuff like that, passed away yesterday. And it was so sad, really, for me because... Here is a man with an exceptional talent, a wonderful photographer. Uh, he's my age. Uh, and he it's rare because often when you leave school, you leave with maybe an idea of what you become. And often you don't become that person. And he became a photographer. He was always interested in it. Everywhere he went with us, he was taking pictures. And it's so interesting. Just before the lockdown, I was trying to really get to catch up with him face to face because we were not, we've only been using this medium. And uh, every time we had it, appointment set he had to go into hospital for a cancer treatment and uh he went he passed yesterday i'm sorry to hear that and was has he been ill for a long time yeah he's been fighting for such a long time you know and it's so interesting because as we all get older our circle of friends gets smaller and smaller mm. and so it's important for all of us that what we should do is keep as much in touch with every single person. I'm not just talking about using social media or this kind of platform. I'm talking about reaching out, calling them up, arranging to have a coffee, a cup of tea and stuff like that. Because every single day, because of the circle of life and how it dictates a route for all of us and a time for all of us, we lose friends. We lose the closest people to us. We lose our right arm and and so it goes on. And so we're all having to learn to cope with a situation which you can't plan for it. Sometimes it just happens and sometimes it's prolonged and you have hope. You keep hope alive and say, look, you know, maybe we could you know, be within each other's company for a lot more years to come, but you never know how long it's going to be. So I say to everyone out there that it's important that no matter who you meet, have a kindly word to say, because every single person out there could be fighting an internal battle that you know nothing about. And when it comes to caring, until you've cared for someone who's been ill, you don't know what caring is. It's so easy to say, I care. But mm. really, until you show or you actually physically do it, uh, it's a totally different thing. And that's only then you realize what it really means. It sounds like you've got or had personal experience of caring. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. My wife's sister, when the surgeons and everybody gave up on her, when they told her that she's got stage four bowel cancer, they gave up and they said, well, you know, that's it now. She won't be lasting long. This is in Jamaica. So for one year, we looked after her in our home. We created a, put a bed downstairs in our home. And uh, for that whole year, we looked after her. And she had a great send-off because I think, again, you know, we just want to really try and find as much reason to laugh about. I mean, yes, I jokingly say, you should always laugh, laugh whilst you still got teeth. 
but I say laugh every time you meet someone, every time you're with someone, every time you say to someone, I care about you, laugh as well, because, you know, it's a joyous moment. It's that richness that happens just for that moment. And that richness is nothing to do with what money can buy. It's all those things that money can't buy. It's the smile. It's the tug of the sleeve. It's that moment when someone puts a hand on your shoulder. It's that smile you weren't expecting. Those are all richness. And we must every day savor those richness, savor every single one of those glorious things, those blessings that we have, because you can, it can be gone just like that. Mm -hmm. One of the aims of this podcast, one of our aims as a, as a charitable organization, Marie Curie, is to try and have more open, honest conversations about death and dying. Because what we know is when people have open, honest conversations about death and dying and or um, have a chance to express their wishes for the future, then we know that people's experiences of death and dying can be improved. And so just going back to your wife's sister, um, when she was diagnosed, um, were there conversations as a family about her future? No, you know, the thing is, right, because my wife's mother and father have both died from cancer many years ago. We all lived in Jamaica. We moved to Jamaica in the year 2000. And um, it literally is now eight years ago that her sister, who wasn't married, but she lived at home with on her own in Jamaica, needed care. And in Jamaica, the hospitals are really substandard. And when it comes to any kind of care, it doesn't exist. And so for us to take her in, we became, if you wish, her family. And, and so what we were able to do was just give her the the kind of comfort, the laughter. She had her good days, she had her down days. And uh, initially it was lots and lots of good days. Out of every month you could go, three weeks was always good and one week bad. And the one week was always around when she was having tests done, with, that's when it was really bad. And then as the months went on, you could see changing where it became 50-50 good and bad days. And then eventually it became, you know, 60-40 you know, our bad days. And, and so it went on. So you knew and it gave you the chance to start preparing for what you knew would be the in inevitable. My wife probably didn't get the chance to mourn very much whilst this was going on because we were so occupied with the care. Um, and so my role, apart from having to lift her up every time she was feeling weak or carry into the car and stuff like that, my role was really just to be there to support my wife and also to try and keep an atmosphere of really kind of kind of happiness all around. For those carers who are listening to our conversation now and who are caring for somebody with a terminal illness, can you talk a bit about what kept you and your wife going, I suppose, particularly at those saddest or most challenging times? You know, when it, when it comes to caring, I say to everyone, you know, we can always say, I care. So easy to say, just kind of rolls off the tongue. But until you actually physically, mentally, emotionally have to care for someone, you actually don't know what caring is about. Um, because, you know, you'd be upstairs and she's downstairs in a special hospital bed that we brought into the home. And you don't really sleep because if you lie on your right side, your left ear remains open. You have to leave the doors open. And every single movement you hear, every sound you hear, you're kind of standing up trying to, associate where's our sound coming from is it downstairs most of the times what you end up doing is my wife would either sleep downstairs and if she didn't we'd swap around or most of the other times we you know we do manage to get to sleep together but in general you don't really sleep you have a rest but you don't sleep you don't get that deep quality sleep where you can just kind of lose yourself in a wonderful i don't know dream you don't really have it you have this kind of kind of superficial level of sleeping and so it was a very difficult time, but we couldn't do anything else because as far as I'm concerned, I believe wholeheartedly that when you give and you give unconditionally, you get it back in so many ways. You know, I remember what turned me on to Marie Curie and it was actually from Jamaica. And the first time was in, I think it was, yeah, it was 2004. I organized a bike ride around Jamaica and we brought from the UK about 40 uh, riders and we organize a ride around Jamaica because, again, because cancer had actually been on my wife's side, I felt the least we could do. And when I found out more about what you did as an organization in terms of that care, uh, we felt that we had to do something. So we did a bike ride. I did a bike ride around Jamaica. 
that was the toughest thing I ever did in my life. I mean, uh, every time I came to the hills, <laughs> right? and, uh, you're dying for that down side of the hill, right? Um, and the thing is, I'm not a rider, but the thing is, we brought all these bikes down and I got on the bike for like the first time for years. And we had a, a chasing group that followed and there was a group that led of bicycle of riders in Jamaica. And we raised a load of money from Maricure. And we did it again. We did it um I think it was about three years later we did it again Amazing. for you guys. Fantastic, yeah. fantastic. Yeah. Well, thank you on behalf of Marie Curie, the organization for that. Um, Derek, can I can I just go back to you? Is it okay if I'm, I ask about um, your sister-in-law's death? Yeah. So thinking about her final hours, and I wondered, I wondered whether that was at home or whether that had happened somewhere else. You know, now that's quite interesting, isn't it? Because... It's so funny when death is near, you kind of know, everybody knows. Now, we had to take her to hospital a number of times during the course of, when I said to, I said to you that it became 60, 40 in terms of bad days, then it became 70, then it became 80. And each time we took her to the hospital for checks, we knew the likelihood that next time we would have to leave her there. And the day that she was going, we knew it because she was at home. And it's like she had been waiting for certain family and friends to come round, right? So her daughter came in from England to say goodbye, literally. And her son came in from England and relatives who lived in St. Elizabeth, which is the southern part of the island where she used to live. They all came up. Everybody came up and everybody was there the whole day. She was bright and sprightly and stuff like that. And people were there until late I remember you know two three o'clock in the morning we were still there all talking and she was up talking and we knew that she was in pain we knew that she was struggling but the thing is she was still laughing her socks off and it looked like she was fine in fact you could almost go she's all of a sudden recovered you could almost kind of feel that and uh, the next day I think it was about 11 o'clock she said I think I need to go down to the hospital I don't feel too good Right. So we I called a private ambulance to come and pick her up. And uh, my wife went with her um, down there. And when we took her down, uh, they took her in immediately. And uh, literally that same afternoon, uh, she went. Just like that. But what a send off she had. Yeah. It, was just, it was just great. You know, it's like, I'll always remember when my, when my mom died. She'd been calling out. I was in England. She said, D, you got to come back. Everyone kept calling me, you got to come. And the only flight I could get was on a Thursday, leaving to go to Jamaica. And I arrived in Kingston. And from Kingston to our home is about three hours. And when I arrived, it was about 11 o'clock in the evening and all the lights were on up there. And as I walk up the stairs and walked in, uh, everyone said to me, D, she couldn't wait any longer. She left literally an hour ago. She died. But she had everyone around her. They had a sing song. They had a party. And, you know, the thing is, every single person's life, everyone, whether you feel that that person passed too soon, everyone's life can be a real inspiration, mm -hmm. can be such an inspiration to other people. And there are lots of people you say to them, you should write your story and people go, no, well, who's going to be interested in my story? My story is insignificant. Wrong. Think about the most insignificant insect, a mosquito. If that is in your bed, think what impact that has on you. That's a mosquito. So every one of us, our lives can be so important. I say that everyone, if we have the ability right now and we're kind of preparing for the inevitable, you know, start talking about your life and recording it and, and share it and make sure that everybody knows because the footsteps you leave behind are going to want to be those wonderful things that other people may just pick up something from and may just go, because of you, I learned this. Because of you, I've changed what I, my life. Because of you, I'm no longer going to smoke. Because of you, because of what you said, because of what you did, guess what? I now feel better about myself. So we can all influence and inspire people. Mm -hmm. Yep, yeah, so true. Um, I, I was interested in um, the, when, when you were describing how families 
at that kind of um, in, in the last few days of somebody's life might start to pull together. So people traveling over from different countries, certainly from England to Jamaica, or those last few days of somebody's life. And actually, when you start to call people up and say, I think it's time. Um, and if there hadn't been any prior conversations, I just kind of wonder how that conversation begins. You know, who has it? Is it the person who's dying that says it's time? Do you just make a judgment call? Yeah, um, you know, it's, it, it is quite interesting because the thing is, yeah, how do you work out how long that person has? Um, and I think there is a kind of inbuilt kind of measure that we have when we feel, when we feel that either hope is actually kind of gone for that person, um, that they, um, you feel like they're, they're giving up and they've kind of made all the preparation. There's just a way in which they seem to have started either mentally sorting out their fears and they're talking about, look, I've done this, it's all in order. And remember to tell the following person this for me and, and say the following thing. They almost start preparing because it's almost like that they know that the door is opening on the other side and it's ajar and they're walking towards it. And they're just saying that, look, you know, my time here now is really close. So I've sorted out more of my fears. I'm ready. Um, but all I know is that everyone we called and people came in from England, they came in in time to see her before she went. Um, so I think we kind of know, I don't know what it is, but it's a sixth sense, but I think it's led very much by the person who's leaving us. They know when they're going. They know when there's no, there's no going back now. They're not going to come back from the edge. And so they, they do and they make all the preparation and start writing notes for you if they're able and if they can't, they're calling you up and they're saying the following. So I think it's that that prepares us who are the, the closest to them. And then we can then transfer it to all the other people that matter. Did your sister-in-law talk about her funeral wishes? Did she say what she wanted at the funeral? Can you tell us about the funeral? Yeah, yeah, she did. She she kind of planned her um, her funeral. She wanted, in Jamaica, there's a way in which most people tend to get buried around their home if you own the land, right? So she had worked this out. She'd worked out what she wanted people to eat. Uh, she worked out, you know, the drinks and laid money aside for it and uh, where the plot would be. And um, she'd already got in touch with an undertaker and we'd already spoken to them and made plans with them exactly where it's going to be. The whole thing was kind of choreographed because in Jamaica, when, a funeral happens. It's the time when you see so many people that you have not seen in your life. It's almost like all of a sudden there's going to be a great big party. In fact, funerals in Jamaica now have become the kind of meeting place for future relationships. Right? <laughs> so invariably, everyone turns up well dressed, and it's not a time. Yes, there is crying because I remember my, my daughter was um, really she was crying a lot and. And my wife is very different. She kind of internalizes a lot. And then she has her quiet moments, right? Um, but really, the, the preparation was there. And it was all choreographed by my sister-in-law. And, uh, you know, she knew exactly, you know, what she wanted. And uh, that's what we gave her. Some of life's questions are harder than others. If you or a loved one are facing end of life or bereavement, Marie Curie is here to listen and help. Call our free support line on 0800 090 2309 or start a web chat by visiting mariecurie.org.uk forward slash support. Just to move on a bit, Derek, now to um, if we could have a conversation about grief and bereavement. So after somebody's died and it sounds like you've had your fair share of loss in your life mm. from mm. um you know what you've what you've said already can you tell us about what your experience of grief is and how you've managed that in the past you know i i've always maintained that if you really care about people in your life you reach out to them whilst they're alive and in reaching out to them it's not just the occasional phone call there's many phone calls and i have my list that every single month I call my friends up and people up. I mean, my, I got a friend right now who's just been moved into ICU. Two years ago, he had a kidney transplant. He's had real difficulty managing with it. He's been on loads and loads of tablets. And then he, three weeks ago, he got cellulitis 
and they have put him on high dosage. He was at home. He's having to do his um, dialysis at home. And they put him on um, heavy dosage of antibiotics. And he, this is my best mate. I speak to him twice a week, three times a week sometimes. You know, I'm his confidant. He's the one he calls up. He's the one who, I'm the one who help him out or, you know, lift him up when he's feeling down. And he's been on these antibiotics and they've not been working. So three nights ago, I had to call the emergency service. He's now, he went into hospital. So how do you deal with it? Um, number one, as I say, I phone my all my friends often every day, but I also speak to their wife every day. So I speak to Norma, I call her up and check how he is. So in my mind, I'm having to do this all this kind of preparation because I'm thinking, how do you come back from the edge when you've been through so much? How do you come back from the edge when there's so much that's wrong with you physically? Now mentally it's affecting you. How do you call that person back? Do you try tough love? Do you try shouting at him and saying, come on, Merce, you can do it. Get up, come on, you can make it. Because internally, if he doesn't have the strength any longer, if he's in so much pain and that pain's really getting at him, right? The only relief for pain is either tablets and if that doesn't work, what's the next relief? We feel like giving up, I believe. And when we feel like giving up is because we go, I can't make this, I can't do this. So. Um, so my grieving has kind of started already because I don't honestly believe that he will come back from where he is. Now, I love him to shock me. I love him to frighten me. I love him to actually, all of a sudden, he's on the phone to me. But when I called him on Tuesday of last week and he, I couldn't get much out of him, I quickly rushed down to his home. When I walked into the home, I couldn't get much out of him then. It was like that. I couldn't understand half of what he was saying. And that's not like him. So when I see someone who is a tenth of the person I used to see, oh, that hits you right between the eyes and right between the heart. Right? And so um, in many ways, when I see that his wife for now five years have had to be this carer nonstop. In fact, it's so strange when I called her up on the day after I went into hospital and she said to me, isn't it funny? Last night was the first real night of sleep I've had in about four years. So, you know, grieving, caring, it affects those close and it affects those further away who are close by just the love of that person. And so I'm happy to make the preparation, mental and physical, emotional preparation right now. I think it's so true what you're talking about, you know, that grieving starts before someone actually dies, before yeah. you have that loss. And, you know, we hear from the people who we support um, about all of those losses, especially if somebody's had, like, like, like your best friend, especially if somebody's had an illness for a long time, then actually people are having, you know, they're, they're, they're losing um, their ability to do the things they've done, whether that is climb a flight of stairs or or, you know, yes. and, and actually, and, and I don't say that flippantly because, you know, I, I remember um, somebody describing to me how they had three stairs from their pavement on the house up to the front door. And actually, because they could no longer do those stairs, that meant they couldn't get out the house. Yeah. And if they couldn't get out the house, that meant they couldn't do all the things they did outside of the home. And so actually, you know, part of our job I think one of the one of the first questions I would ask somebody is what matters to you you know what's important to you right now in your illness what do you want to achieve and this person said I want to achieve those three steps oh. so it's like okay we call the physiotherapist in yes. and you know that's what we work on so yeah. actually that individual can then get out of the house absolutely right but you know something Jason I mean whenever I do talks and stuff and I've been doing a lot recently to lots of companies and individual and i always say to them you know what the greatest gift is that you can give yourself your family your work colleagues it's an independent healthier you because if you can somehow maintain your health and do all those things that just kind of add quality to your life has a great place to be right and that's why every one of us right as much as and how no matter how tough it is we have got to try and move as much as we can. Even if it's only a small step, that small step can give you such a rewarding feeling. And so I, I believe that, you know, every single person listening right now, 
if you do nothing else but tomorrow, but just even if it's just even if it's just stand up and sit down, stand up and sit down. If you do that a few times, that just adds to your quality of your life. Mm. Mm. Derek, do you ever think about your own death? Um, no, because I think I'm going to live so long. I think, you see, I think I'm going to live to 114. I've got this vision of me at 114. I've got my Lycra on. It no longer fits. It no longer stretches. <laughs> I, I've got my Zimmer frame. Yes. And I'm still going, push your right hand up, your left hand up. And, uh, <laughs> and, and that's, that's where I am with it. And I, I don't that's fear the best it. image. Oh, yeah. I mean, I don't fear it in any way. I believe that. As long as throughout my life, I have been considerate and kind to people out there. I believe that I'm going to get it back in so many ways. And and if I don't get it back, my family will get it back. And I jokingly said a few years ago, and it ended up in the papers somehow, I said, listen, when I go, I want to be cremated. And uh, I want my ashes there mixed with fish paste and made into sandwiches and given to all the people who I don't like. And I thought, well, there wouldn't be anybody eating it because I tend to like everybody anyhow. Um, no, no, no. I, you know what? I've said to you about footsteps. The footsteps you leave behind are really critical. And that's why for me, I hope that everybody would just look at me and go, you know what? He always made me smile. Everywhere I go, every time he sees me, he makes me smile. It makes me feel good. That's, that's me. And so my own death, I just think, I want loads of people crying. I want loads of people missing me. I want loads of people saying, oh, there's some joy that's been removed. The J out of joy has gone. The H out of happiness, I've gone. That's where I want to be. <laughs> and it sounds like it sounds like on a practical level, which is also something else. You know, we encourage is to make plans for um, you know around death and die, and then whether that's funeral plans or whether that is some of the practical things like writing a will or saying whether you want to be buried or whether whether you want to be cremated. And have you made some of those practical plans? Oh, for sure. I mean, I, I listen, I talked over with my wife uh, so many times because I said to her, listen, the circle of life dictates that one of us may go first. Both of us could go together. Wouldn't that be great if it's that way around? Because I can't imagine what my life would be without you. And she said the same thing. And we talked about, we made a will and stuff like that. And, you know, I leave everything to her and she leaves everything to me. And then our kids can share it if we're not here. Uh, we talked about me being cremated, and I'm serious. I do not want to go in a box. I want to be cremated and sprinkle my ashes anyway. It doesn't really matter. I'm not there anyhow. I'll be upstairs looking down. In fact, I'm looking forward to meeting up with some of the old friends who I love dearly who went too early. I believe that what keeps me going is the fact that he who has health has hope, and he who has hope has everything. And I believe that the lifestyle I've had have kept me really healthy and this kept any condition that may be bubbling underneath kept it down one day yeah sure they may break out but i honestly my positive frame of mind tells me it's not going to break out for now so i believe i'm going to be around for a while longer i'm 70 next year and i've got lots of plans right and i and i've made all the plans in terms of what will happen when i when i have to go and um and i i really i'm not worried about death in any way um, you know, I believe that, you know, I've, I've lived a life that's been full. I've done so much. I've done more than I ever imagined that I'd ever do. I've been to places I've never thought I'd go to. I mean, I've met people, prime ministers and presidents and stuff like that. I've met stars and I've eaten well. I've traveled well. I've done everything. Now, there isn't many things left on my bucket list that, you know, apart from doing crazy games. I've done everything and I never imagined I would because my careers officer, all he said to me was, Evans, all you're going to be good for is to work in an office. And I've surprised him and surprised me in terms of the journey I've had. And, and yesterday I was in an exhibition and when I saw everybody who walked in were just queuing up to take pictures or shake my hand or thank me, I go out for a meal and the guy says to me, we're not charging, you don't have to pay, you can have it because you bring joy to me. Hey, come on. Come on, that's where I am. Mm, that's wonderful. That's so great. Derek, just before we finish, can I ask what it's meant to you today to come on the Marie Curie couch? I think, you know, coming on the couch and talking about the experience that I've had, I can sum it up like this. When we go to school, in fact, the difference between school 
and life is this. When you go to school, they teach you a lesson and then they give you a test. But in life, often what happens is that you're given a test which teaches you a lesson. And so every test that we're given, everything, whether you're losing a loved one, whether you're having to care for someone, whether you're having to see someone go, that's life giving you a lesson. And all those lessons, if you embraced it, embrace all those lessons, it makes you so much stronger. It becomes a foundation stone for who you are. And it puts you in a wonderful position where every day you can just stand up and be proud of who you are. And that God-given life you've been given, treasure it for whatever period you have. Just treasure it and look after it. Because as I've said many times, you're only given one life. And if you look after it, it's going to last you a lifetime. And when something bad happens, it's only a bad moment. It is not a bad life. So just look in the mirror daily and love what you see and be happy with what you see. And then every time you walk down the street, smile and let someone feed off that smile and feed back at you and give you the energy to keep on smiling. And that's what I think it's all about in the end. Well, Derek Evans, thank you for joining me on the Marie Curie Couch today. Thank you for sharing the learnings from your lessons in life. And great to meet you. Thank you. So that's all for this episode of On the Marie Curie Couch. We hope it's got you thinking about matters of life and death and perhaps starting those conversations with your own friends and family. Marie Curie's here to help. From planning ahead to coping with bereavement, you can talk through any concerns you have around the end of life with our support line team, which also includes specially trained nurses. Call us on 0800 080 2309 or search Marie Curie online. The podcast is produced and edited by Marie Curie with support from Ultimate Sound and Vision. And the music featured is Time Lapse by Pan Oceanic. If you've enjoyed this podcast, please do like and subscribe. Thanks for listening. And until next time, goodbye. Goodbye.